Welcome everybody to today's webinar on Oracle Analytic Functions. Learn how to use Oracle Analytic Functions. My name is Dave Anderson. I'll moderate today. Our presenter is Jeff Wyland of Skill Builders, and Jeff is a 30-year uh, veteran of information technology. Uh, he has been uh, training Oracle uh, database subjects for the last you know, 12 years or so, and he is also an Oracle developer and has a lot of expertise in not only Oracle PL SQL and SQL, but is also an XML expert and has a CTT Plus certification and an Oracle OCA certification. So we're very happy to have Jeff with us today. So I'm going to pass it over to Jeff in just a second. If you have any questions as we go through today's training, just chat them in and I'll field them over to Jeff anytime there's a pause in the session. Hopefully at the end we'll have a few minutes for questions as well. Uh, you can reach Jeff at jeff.wyland at skibbolders.com if you have questions after the session today. So without any further delay, I'll pass it right over to Jeff Wyland. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, we're going to get right into it this uh, today. We're going to be talking about analytic functions. We'll go over a whole bunch of examples as well as syntax, talk about where you use it, where it's advantageous, and so on. Uh, we only have the hour, so I'm going to move right into things. And as Dave said, if you have questions, you can submit them to him in the chat. And Dave will be watching the questions and may, uh, may jump in from time to time uh, with any that he sees uh, would be useful for the group. OK, a little introduction here. Analytic functions have been around in Oracle for a long time now. Believe it or not, they've been here since Oracle 8. It's just that a lot of people don't know about them, and they, they don't know all the power that they can bring. Oracle was very early to the game in bringing these analytic functions in, and there has been discussion about them for many years, and they were finally added to the ANSI standard back in 2003. Um, Oracle has been adding to the ANSI standard uh, for years now, and even in 11G, they've added some new functions into the analytic functions. Now, you're going to see analytic functions with names like average and sum and count and so on. They have the same names as the aggregate functions, but they have a different purpose in life. And that's what we're going to learn today. We'll see what the syntax is, and we'll learn the purpose. That the main thing is, what's the purpose, and what can these things do for us? So even though you see something like average and sum, it does not necessarily mean that, that it's an aggregate function. It may very well be an analytic function. So let's look at what do they do? What's the value of these analytic functions? Um, the first key is it's to, its purpose is to analyze data in a very powerful and very efficient way, much more efficient than you could do yourself without an analytic function. Uh, the kind of things you do are, for instance, cumulative totals. What if you want salaries, but you want cumulative salary within the department? And when the next department comes in, you want, the, you want the cumulative salary to start over again. What if you want to show sales by day with, by store? And every and you want to show for the sales for the first day of the month, the second day of the month, the third, and you want them to accumulate because you want to see what percentage of your goal you're at at, at, a, at a specific day. Those are the kind of things you can do. Next type of thing you can do here is percentages within a group. What you know, what percentage of the total salary in this department does this person represent? What percentage of the total sales within a division does each salesperson represent? So these are all anal uh, things that analyze data in fairly sophisticated ways. And even some other things like ranking. Very often we rank by sorting data in descending order. We want the, the top sales people on the top. But what we would like to do is show the ranking. This is the top person, number one, number two, number three, number four. Well, all the things I just mentioned can be done with standard SQL, but they're a lot less efficient and a lot less clear and obvious what you're doing. Because regular S uh, SQL doesn't have these capabilities built in, so you need workarounds. And we know whenever you have a workaround, it's a, it's, sometimes it's difficult to see what's really going on. 
Okay, so that's, that's the purpose of all of these things. So we, we're going to have analytic functions. They're going to operate on a query result. And when we do a normal query, we get a result set. And the analytic functions are then going to operate on these sorts of result sets. So let's look at the first simple example. There's a lot more complexity to it, but we're just working on a simple example. Uh, we're he I'm hearing some rustling and noise on the line. So if, um, if Dave, if you can just check if anybody for any reason is not, um, is not muted, mute them. Thank you very much. Okay. Will do, Jeff. Will do. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so the analytic functions, here's the first one. Notice we have a sum of salary. We're going to get the employee number, last name, and salary. And so that's all fairly standard. We're going to order it by employee number. So it's in sorted order by employee number. And then we want a cumulative running total to so see what's the total uh, up to that each point. So what we do is we say sum the salary over order by EMPNO. So the order by tells us what the sorted order is going to be. So this order by up here in the analytic function should be the same generally as the order by in the actual SQL command. And then notice what happens. Cumulative salary is 8. 8 plus 8 is 16, plus 12 more is 28. This gives you running totals. So here what we have is a, a uh, analytic function that's the sum with an over clause and an order by. Whenever you see the over clause, this, this is the key that says this sum is not an aggregate, it's an analytic. Without the over clause, sum and salary is, is simply an aggregate function. We've been using those for years, but with the over clause, it becomes an analytic function. Well, this is of, of some use, and in a lot of cases, we can see where this would be very useful. But uh, we're going to have a lot more capabilities than just this. Now, remember I said analytic functions have two main purposes. One is they give us capabilities of doing things in a, in, that we can't do in normal SQL, and we need workarounds. And secondly, they do it very efficiently. The reason it's so efficient is we're telling Oracle exactly what we want to do. So Oracle can implement it in SQL under the covers to do these things in a very efficient way. If you don't have this kind of syntax for analytic functions, you can generally get the same results, but you have a lot more work to do, and it's a lot less efficient. So just to highlight that, that whole concept, let's think of how we would do this particular query, getting running totals, without an analytic function. And there were workarounds. So let's take a look at the workaround. This was the old way to do it before analytic functions. What did we have to do? We selected the employee number, last name, and salary. But now we have a subquery within the select clause for the next next column. And remember, this is supposed to be running totals. So we're going to use a trick, a workaround. We're going to select sum of salary from employee E2, the same employee table, but the outer employee table is E1, the inner one is E2, where E2.empno is less than or equal to E1.empno. Remember, we're ordering by empno. So what this little trick does is it says, hey, go sum all the salaries for the employee E2 for the employee's number as long as the number is less than the employee number that we're up to. And that will give us these running totals that we saw done simply with an analytic function. But notice what we're doing here. We have a subquery that is a correlated subquery. The inner query references e1.epno, which is a column from the outer query. And, 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 as, uh, and as we know, whenever you have a correlated subquery like this, it re-executes the inner query for every row in the outer query. That's the issue. So let me go and jump into SQL Plus just to show you how this might work. I have a function called analytic functions2. Let's see if we have that. Here it is. Here's analytic functions2. 
And this is a little query, and the first thing it does here is it creates a table with a lot of rows in it, a whole bunch of rows. So it's going to create that. Then it's going to use the analytic function and trace the result here for the analytic function and time how long it takes to run this query with an analytic function. And then it comes down here and does the same thing with the built-in subquery. That's a correlated subquery and times that. So that's what we're going to do here in this query. So let's go back here. I'm going to run my analytic functions to query. First thing it's doing is it's running around and building with some random data a table to do the analysis with. And once we have that table, we can then run both queries. So here's the first one. We ran the first query, and it does a pause, and it waits. So let's look at the first query. The first query does a select with a sum of salary over order by ID. Okay, we're doing it for all rows, and we have 70, almost 72,000 rows that were selected. It started at 13.10.52. It ran, and it ended at 13.10.53. A second, one second to do that. Okay, so with the analytic function, when we want running totals, and think of it, if you were going to generate running totals, it's very easy. As you get the rows, all you would do is just add the value to the, to the subtotal. It w it's really a very easy process if you know what you want to do. But the next one is going to do it the old way where we didn't have analytic functions, so we needed that workaround. So let's hit enter here, and now this is running. Now remember the other one took a second probably between you know, two and a half a second and a second and a half, somewhere in that range. And this one's running. And this one's still running. And I'm going to leave this one running, and we'll come back to it later and see how long it took to run this. But as you can see, we're talking about not an order of magnitude, multiple orders of magnitude, many, many times longer to do it the old way. So analytic functions do things that you cannot do directly in SQL. You have to have workarounds, and therefore they're vastly more efficient, and they do things that you can't do directly and easily in SQL. You need to come up with a workaround. So I'm just going to minimize that, and we will go back to, the, to that later and see how long it actually took. So that's, that's that function. So all we've done so far in analytic functions is a running total. But we can do a lot more with analytic functions than just running totals. So let's see what the syntax is first, in general, for an analytic function. It's a function name, like sum, or min, or max, or average, or whatever. And it takes multiple arguments, one to three arguments, depending on the function. The keyword over is, is critical. We need the keyword over. And then we have three clauses. They're all optional clauses. You need one of them, but they, you don't need all three of them. The only one we've seen so far is the order by clause. You can also have a partition clause and a windowing clause. The over defines it as an analytic function, not an aggregate function. So what we're going to spend the rest, of, uh, the rest of our time with today is looking at the full syntax and seeing how we can do some of the things that we discussed up front, like not just running totals, but running totals within a department so it restarts at a department, or ranking and a number of other capabilities. OK, first let's look at the partition clause. The partition clause breaks the result set into different groups. And the function that we're using, sum, min, max, average, and so on, works independently on each group. If you don't have a partition clause, there is a default group, which is the entire result set. Well, let me go back a couple of pages here. And look, here we had an order by that said, give me running totals, of course I did sums, with no partition. So the partition was the entire result set, so it went through the whole result set. Never reset anything, because there was no partition. Now let's come back here to the partition clause. The optional, it's optional, the default group is the entire result set, which we just saw. But if you partition, then it starts the the running totals over again for each individual partition. 
Well, this sounds familiar. <laughs> What is, it, what, did, what is it similar to? It's similar to the normal group by for aggregate functions. If you say sex select sum of salary from employee, you're, you don't have a group by. Therefore, the default group is the entire result set. Nice and easy. But if you do say select sum of salary from employee, and you're selecting not just sum of salary, but let's say department number comma sum of salary, and you say group by department number, in essence, you have a partition, and you're giving the sum of the salary for each department. Same thing here. Without a group by in an aggregate function, the default group is the whole result set. Without a partition by in the analytic function, the default partition is the entire result set. Okay? so. That, that you've got you've got very similar results there, very uh, they're comparable to one another. So let's look at a partition by example. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do my sum of salary over mix in an analytic function, but this time I'm going to partition by department number. Without an order by, I can have a partition and an order by. We'll see that in a little while, but this is a partition by just department number. And look what you get. With a partition, it says sum the salary over each partition department number, and it shows the total salary for department 1. 12 plus, uh, 22 plus 12 plus 25 is 59. It starts over. Department 2, what's the total salary? 8 plus 9 plus 8 is 25, and so on. So all this gives, a partition by with no order by, when you're doing a sum, just is kind of like the group by with a sum. It gives you one total, and it's the same total for each department. OK, well, this can be pretty useful, because I can expand this somewhat. And I could do easily, let's say I wanted to see what percent of the department salary each employee represents. What percent of a department salary does each employee represent? Well, all that is is 22 divided by 59 times 100 to convert it to percent. So I could have another column that says percent of uh, department. And all I would do is salary divided by this whole expression, sum of salary over partition by divide, uh, times 100. And I would get the percent that each employee represents of their department's total, which is a kind of nice capability. And I think I might have that here. You look at the. Uh, well, I went back to the first one, and notice it's still running. <laughs> Remember that first one I started a few minutes ago? It is still running. It has not finished yet. All right, so let's go to another one, um, analytic functions 3. It's a little, little function that I showed, and this one does just what we talked about. Uh, just now. It takes the salary divided by the sum of salary over the partition by, multiplies it by 100, and it says do right represents at 21.65, represents 37% of the total 57.8. So there's the example where it's very easy to show percent of total within a partition. Of course, there are other ways to do this. You could generate another table that had the total salary for each department. You could then do a join of one table versus the other table and do your division. But of course, you're doing a lot more work, and it's going to be slower. OK. So that is our, those are our examples for a partition by and a partition with a overclaw, uh, a partition with, without a order by clause, just a partition clause. We can do all of that with just that partition clause. Well, now let's revisit the order by clause. We've had a very simple one before. So let's look at the full capabilities of an order by clause. It has two main purposes, this order by clause, two distinct purposes. Okay, so we've got two distinct purposes. First one, define the order of the rows to be used in the computation. Well, we saw that. We said we were going to order it by employee ID or whatever, and those were the, that's the order that the rows uh, were added in. 
you could have done a different order on any column that you wanted. The second purpose is it defines a default window, which we haven't seen yet. Remember, there were three clauses, the order by, the partition by, and the windowing clause. We're going to get into the windowing as the last piece in, in this whole thing, but, um, uh, but for now, we need a default window. Without a windowing clause, we need a default window. And the default window that the order by clause specifies is the current row plus all preceding rows. Current row plus all preceding rows. Okay? Without an order by, we know that the function becomes an aggregate function. We basically get the totals. We saw that when we had a partition without an order by. It just gave us the total for the whole department. Okay, so it's got two purposes. Let's look back at the default window, which is the second purpose of the order by, and that is the current row plus all preceding rows. Okay, let's go back to our first example here. Notice, here's an order by, and we're summing the salary, and what salaries do we sum? It's always the current row plus all preceding rows. So if we're going to sum the salary, since we have an order by, without a windowing clause, the default window is current row plus all preceding rows. So let's look. 8 plus all preceding rows, there are none, is 8. 8 plus 8 is 16. 12 plus 8 plus 8 is 28, and so on. It's always the current row plus all preceding rows. That's my default window. When we get to the windowing clause, we can change that. It doesn't have to be the current row plus all preceding rows. We can specify exactly what range of rows or what rows we want to include, but the default is always the current plus all the preceding if you have an order by. Okay, so let's move ahead. And that was our default group. That was our default window current row plus all preceding rows. So let's now look at an example that has both the partition by and the order by. Here we're saying partition by department number, order by last name. Now notice when we do that, an interesting thing is that we always pretty much want to order it by the partition by first and then the order by next. So we partitioned by department number up here. That was our partition by, and then we ordered by last name. So we want to sort the result in the same way. The partition first, and then the order by second. Now notice, since the partition by is department number, here we have three rows with department one. As a result, the sum of salary is the current row plus all preceding rows within the partition because we have a partition by. There is no windowing clause, so the default order is the current row plus all preceding rows, but when you have a partition, it's always within the partition. So we have 22, 22 plus 12, it, or 12 plus 22 is 34, 25 plus all preceding rows in the same partition is 59. Now we start with a new partition, partition department number two, so we start over Current row plus all preceding rows within department two, there are none, it's just an eight. Current row is nine plus all preceding rows in department two, nine plus eight is our 17 and so on. So this is where we can get running totals within a partition. Very, very nice capability. Okay, and Let's move on to one more slide here at this point. And this shows us the employees by department, cumulative salary, and cumulative salary by department. So here we can do both, of course. We can get running totals and running totals within department. Easy, the first one has sum of salary over, and it's got an order by with no partition. The second one has the same thing, but it adds in a partition. So we get so we restart. And you can have any combination of these capabilities. Okay. Um, Dave, do you want to uh, try to put up the first poll at this point? We'll uh, just, uh, we have a couple of little brief polls here. 
Uh, sure thing, Jeff. Hang on. Poll is up. Everyone should see it at this point. And please go ahead and answer the question. Good. We've got about 50% voted so far. Terrific. Let's get everybody's votes. If you don't know it, just guess. An, in, an informed guess, but just guess. Oh, we're doing good. We're up to 75 percent. Jeff, as, uh, as, as they uh, answer the poll, I wanted to let you know there's been uh, many good questions come in. I've been able to handle uh, several of them. I got one here for you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so one of our students is asking, can I use the employee number as order by, or I guess in the order by, even if it is not part of the select clause? Oh, um, I think that was sure. Harkening back That's, to your previous example, yeah, I would say, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the, generally you can, you know, in any order by clause or or anything you're doing in a where clause, you can always have a column that you're referencing that's not in the select clause, and that would apply to this as well as any other any other query in SQL. Applies to analytic functions just as well. Good question. Thank you. All right, how are we doing, Dave? We got most of the people res responding. Yes, we've got 88% uh, of the people have uh, have voted. And, and what's the consensus? Oh, I think we've got an overwhelmingly uh, good answer. We've got 93%. Uh, Jeff say that uh, um, it defines the group upon which the analytic function applies. Okay, very good. We're we're doing very well. I like that. I like that percentage. Thank you. That is correct. Defines uh, the purpose of an analytic partition by clause. Defines the group upon which the analytic function applies. It starts over with each group. And I think we have one more uh, um, one more oh. poll, Dave. You want to put that up? Sure. Here's the results of the here's the results of the first one. Okay. And. Let's take a look. We have one more poll. And here it is. The analytic function order by clause defines what default window. So if everybody would go ahead and participate, give us your best guess answer on that, we'd appreciate it. Great. Any other questions, meanwhile, Dave, that uh came in that you think I should address? Sure. Uh, here is one from Thomas. The analytic functions are very powerful. Yeah, we agree, Thomas. Uh, these, these, th these things are uh, very, very powerful. Uh, and uh, the question is, or uh, uh, request, uh, Jeff, is please recommend any books that cover it in great detail. I've actually added the word great, but in detail. OK, terrific. At the very end, uh, we will put up a slide with some recommendations of, uh, of places to go for additional information, in particular on analytic functions. So uh, just hang in there uh, for a little while longer, and we'll have a slide on that at the end of the presentation. Good point, because the, you know there's a lot of materials, but uh, some of them speak specifically to where do you really use this? What's, where's the capabilities? You know, show us some real life uh, examples of it. And those, those are the most useful. Syntax, once you get used to it, is fairly straightforward. Understanding all the nice places you can use it is, uh, is the really useful thing. Yeah, we've got uh, probably more questions in the queue than uh, we, can, uh, we can handle. But let me give you a couple of more, Jeff, while we have uh, a moment here. Uh, does it matter in which order? the order by and the partition by clauses appear. Can order by appear before partition by? Oh, that's a good question. And uh, I always put the partition by and then the order by in there. Um, the syntax, I would, I would have to check that. You know, I, the, those, those are the questions 
those are the questions I have the most trouble with, and I'll tell you why. Because a lot of people will ask me, what happens when, um, when you do this? And, and often it's when you do something that kind of just doesn't look right or is not the standard way. Not that there's anything wrong with that question. It's a great question, but I don't try those, so I, you know, so I tend not to, not to know those sometimes. So let's take a look at the syntax. The syntax just shows three clauses. Uh, so on this syntax, I would not have a way of knowing unless I try it. Dave, you have a, a clue on that? I, I would guess, because I haven't tried it the other way either, but I would guess no, um, that uh, the order does matter, but that is a guess. Yeah. So I'm going right. to say educated guess <laughs> is right, uh, it matters. But uh, Brooke can try it when he, gets a, when he or she gets a chance. So. Okay, great. And okay, how do we do on the do on the poll, Dave? Oh, very good. Yeah, let me get back to that. Uh, looking really good. We've got eighty six percent voted. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll and show, share it with you guys. And there's your uh, there's your result, Jeff. Uh, can you see the result? Uh, I see. Uh, current rows. Seventy eight percent said the current row plus all preceding rows is the uh, default window. Okay, so 78% got it right. It's the current row plus all preceding rows. Uh, so if you need a default window, the analytic order by gives you a default which is only used when there is no windowing clause. And it's always the current row plus all preceding rows, and it's really all preceding rows, of course, within the partition, if there is a partition. Okay, and Dave, why don't I turn this over to you for uh, uh, the next slide here. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, we, we do have some classes coming up on Advanced SQL, and indeed this uh, class covers analytic functions in, in, in uh, fairly good detail, uh, a bit more detail, of course, than you get here, plus you get hands-on uh, workshops. So these are online classes um, that, we, that we run, but uh, the May, 13th, uh, May 11th through 13th will be conducted by Jeff, and you would have direct uh, either voice over IP or telephone communication to Jeff for the entire class. And he'd walk you through uh, the different uh, lessons, uh, show you demonstrations, hands-on workshops, and be there to support you. It is limited to six students because there is two-way audio. And we do want to give Jeff adequate time to address all of your questions that you may that you may have. So, if you wanted to register, you'd go to our website, uh, scubblers.com, online classes. And you might see a calendar like this, and you could choose a class that you wanted to join. For example, the Advanced SQL Queries is currently the third one down the list. And if you drill down on that, it takes you to another page which has all of the details about the class and what your enrollment includes. And it's got a topic summary which lists all of the things that would be covered. And again, again there are hands-on workshops. And we will supply, of course, an Oracle database that you can connect to for your labs. And um, there are some basic prerequisites. You, you, you want to have a, a basic grounding in the SQL language before you take the advanced SQL. Um, you might use SQL Plus or SQL Developer or Toad. Whatever your tool of choice is, we would support you on that. So it's... it's uh, Quite, quite a comprehensive uh, coverage of the Oracle SQL lang advanced language. Um, so you'd see a lot of Oracle extensions uh, to the SQL language. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass it right back over to Jeff, and we'll continue on with today's training. OK, thank you, Dave. All right, let's now hit the windowing clause. We have covered the order by. And uh, the order by clause in you know in some uh, some uh, detail and the partition by clause and now we need the windowing clause. It basically defines the beginning and the end of the rows that are included in the analytic function. We know that uh, a, there's a partition, and and if you have a partition by clause, that restarts everything. But within the partition, without a windowing clause. It always works from the first row in that partition up to the current row. 
current row plus all previous rows. Remember, that was the default when you have an order by clause, but no windowing clause. Well, with a windowing clause, you can actually define the start and the end row within the group. So that's what we're going to chat about here. And what we have is two types of windows that we're going to look at, a row window and a range window. The row window just indicates the number of windows to include in the computation, the number of rows, I should say, to include in the computation. Do I want it to include 10 rows, 20 rows, 50 rows, 1,000 rows, whatever? That is the less sophisticated one. The more sophisticated is a range window rather than a row window. And that applies a filter to the window, and it is, it is really extremely powerful, which we'll see in some examples coming up. Uh, let me go back here. Okay. Okay, so let's look first at the less sophisticated one, which is the row windows. And let's say, uh, this is kind of uh, just a uh, made up example to give you a feel for what it is. But we're going to say we want to analyze only the current row and the one preceding row. And there's a lot of syntax in here for a number of things, but we can say rows 1 preceding. You could say rows 100 preceding. You could say rows 1 following. Any, you know, any combination of those things. But let's say we have rows 1 preceding. So we're going to sum the salary over. We have a partition by and an order by and rows 1 uh, preceding. So for the first one, we have 22. And the last column, employee plus previous, is 22 plus the one preceding row. There is no preceding row, so it's 22. The next one is 12 plus one preceding row is 22 is 34. The next one is 25. Now, in the past, without rows one preceding, it would default to all preceding rows within department one. But instead, it's going to say 25 plus only one preceding row and give it 37. Now we start with department two, so we start all over. Current row is eight. Any preceding rows in department two, there are none. Therefore, the total is eight. Nine plus eight is 17. Eight plus nine is 17. Rows one preceding. You can have as many rows preceding, as many rows following as you want. And there are certain cases where that makes sense, because you only want to analyze, let's say, Let's say you were looking at uh, sales by date or whatever, and you only want to analyze the last uh, 100 sales. So you might say rows 100 preceding or rows 100 following. Uh, or, and you can do the combination. You can do rows 100 preceding and rows 100 following, and then you'll get a start and an end row. So you can do both of those. Let's now look a little bit further at a range window. Here we're going to apply, and this is more sophisticated, because it's going to do a calculation based on data rather than just number of rows. Here I want average salary over order by hire date. In this case, we have no uh, uh, partition. So therefore, it's going to use the whole result set. But it says range 365 proceeding. So we're going to go one year proceeding. So I want to show this person's salary, I'm ordering it by hire date, so it shows in an ascending order of hire date. And I get the salary, and I want the average salary of this employee and every employee hired within the last 365 days. Now, range 365 preceding goes from the hire date, because that's what I'm ordering by. So it actually says, employee Anderson has a salary of eight, and I'm going to get the average salary for Anderson and anyone hired within 365 days before them. Well, there was no one. The average is eight. Here, Washington is 12. Well, Anderson was hired within the last 365 days. 12 plus eight is 20. Average that for two people is 10. Then I get two people hired on the same date, August 94. I take those two. It turns out that within the last 365 days, it includes everyone before them. The average of those four is 1675. Now I get March 95, and then I have to say, who's been hired in one year before them? And it turns out it's everyone except for this February 94. And if you add up all of these and average them, you'll see you get a 14.33. 
That's a, it's a little more obvious with August of 97. No one was hired within 365 days before them, so therefore the average is just 13. There was no one else. So you can get fairly complex with this kind of analysis. And if you take a look here, the range windows define an offset from the start to the end. I can do range end preceding. I can do range end following, where n is it has to be a numeric or a date value. And notice how I said range uh, 365 preceding for a date. Well, that's not really a good way to get a year beforehand. So they allow you for dates to do range interval n days, n months, n years preceding or following. And just to give you an example here, uh, I'm going to go down and show you a quick little view of uh, some other code that we have here in our notes. Down in the notes, if you can read this, notice you can say average salary over order by hire date, range interval six month preceding, or range interval six month preceding and current row. That's the same thing as this. Or you can actually do between range six month preceding and range six month following, which we'll see in the next slide, that kind of thing. So that's a very nice capability. Gives you a, a, lot, of, a lot of functionality. So let's look at that. Here's our between. I'm getting average salary over order by hire date. And notice, remember, since I have an order by here, I want to order by the same thing here. Order by hire date, range between 182 preceding and 182 following. Well, I could have said, you know, I could have done my interval six months, which would have been a better way. Okay, so we'll see that coming up also. But there's some other special functions when you do this range. You can have a last value and a first value. So I do a last value, last name, and I have the same syntax here, over, order, by, and so on. And the purpose of last value and first value is to show you the actual data value of the first row that was in the analysis and the last row that was in the analysis. So it actually can give you the real data values. And if we look at the next slide, this shows us that the real data values for the win last row, uh, the last row in the analysis is, which we're calling window bottom, it's saying this person, Anderson, for the next for 182 days after that, who's the last person? Well, Wells is the last person that was that was in this analysis. So this tells you right away the 1675 includes the 8, the 12, the 22, and the 25, because Wells is the window bottom. Now that stays the same for here until you get to this row, Perry. And Perry says, well, six months after March 15th, well, that goes all the way down to Summers and so on. OK? and does not include Hall. So you can do a Windows bottom and a Windows top kind of analysis very easily. Doing the same thing with an interval, I can pick range between interval six month preceding and interval six month following. And I can ask for a first value and a last value, which is kind of cool. And I can call them Windows start and window end. And then I can show my data. And if someone's looking at the analysis, instead of trying to figure out who's six months before and six months after, what date does that include? This is not, this date is not the date that's exactly six months before and six months after, obviously. Of course, Anderson, there was no one before them. These are the data values. Since there's no one before Anderson in six months, it, the window start starts right here at February 1st. I mean, it's easy to just find six months before. You just do an add months and so on. But this shows you the real data values. And it says, hey, the last data value was April 21. And that was what was included in here six months after. August 2nd is one day more than six months after. So it's not included in the analysis. That's why, uh, uh, excuse me, August 2nd actually in this one is included in the analysis. OK? so. This gives you the actual beginning and end of the window, which is a very nice capability. Uh, one more thing I want to get into here, and that's the ranking functions. Besides all the things that we talked about, where we did averages and we did Mac and we did uh, um, sums, and that you can do all these many, many other 
uh, functions in here that we haven't talked about. What, one of the key ones, or two of the key ones, is dense rank and rank. Notice here, I am going to partition by department number, order by salary. So I'm ordering by salary descending within the department number. And I am now asking for dense rank and rank. So notice what dense rank is. This is the highest, number one, number two, number three. The highest, the second highest, and third highest within the department. Then it starts over because we have our partition, number one, two, and two. Because Anderson and Summers are tied, so they get one and two. And notice the person who's the next one, temporary, who's in department two, is gives is a number three. They get a number three here. Temporary is dense rank three, but ranked four. That's the difference between dense rank and rank. If there's someone that's tied, they get the same value. With dense rank, it doesn't skip a value. It gives the very next value. So you get one, two, two, and three in department two for dense rank. But with rank, you get one, two, two, and four. And it all depends on the uh, uh, statistician and which way they want to see it. Do they want to see dense ranks or ranks? Again, you can do workarounds to try to resolve this, but it takes a lot more work, a lot more code. You're faking it. You tell, you, Oracle doesn't know what you're doing. And as a result, it's going to take a lot longer. As a matter of fact, while we're at that, why don't we go back to our first one and let's see. That, oh, that was the wrong window. Let's go back to this one. It finally did finish. Well, let's look. Remember, the first one took under around a second to run. This one started up here at 13.11.52, 11.52, and finished at 27.24. We're talking like 16 minutes versus under a second. I mean, you can see amazing, amazing differences. You want to, especially in data warehouses, large volumes, anywhere you're doing a lot of work, you want to go with analytic functions because the response time is so much better. Why is the response time better? Because Oracle knows exactly what you want to do and can come up with a very easy, clean algorithm to do it rather than a workaround that we have to generate. OK, I think that covers most of the things that, we, that I wanted to cover here. We're running a little short on time. I'd like to uh, uh, finish up with a couple of questions if we can. So I'm going to move ahead and just give you a list of some of the main analytic functions. We talked about average. We didn't talk about count, but you can do count. We did dense rank, first value. There's lead and lags, all the standard max min. We did rank. There's other standard deviation. And there's probably around 20 others besides these that, does all, that do all sorts of statistical analysis, which is a very, you know, really nice capabilities if you need to do statistical analysis. Someone had asked about other resources. Tom Kite's book, Expert One-on-One -on -one Oracle, has a very, a very good section on, on this. And he usually has really nice things. Uh, and he, he really can explain it nicely. Uh, we've got some noise uh, feedback on rustling again in, in the, on the um, phone, Dave, just to let you know. But I'll be done in a minute anyway. And uh, the Oracle SQL reference, of course, goes into the technical aspects. And the data warehousing guide goes into it a lot, because especially in data warehouses, that's where you do a lot of analysis. And you have huge amounts of data. And this becomes even more important to do this very efficiently. So uh, Dave, uh, were there any other questions uh, that uh, you think we should, uh, that we should hit, since we have a few minutes left? Yeah, uh, there, there were actually uh, loads of questions coming in. I was uh, typing fast and furious. I don't think I got to all of them. Um, actually, I asked uh, a couple of the uh, students to email us uh, their questions because they were fairly detailed. Uh, the student who had a question about case and count, um, go ahead if you want to email me your uh, question. Um, Lee, uh, if you want to talk further about uh, doing monthly ranges with a, uh, a picture string, a date format string, uh, email it over. Um, uh, yes, uh, Steve's got a point. There are some actually some newer analytic functions in 11G. Um, that are not found in 10G. Uh, good point, Steve, and you would see those in the class. Um, 
Thanks that for is that. true. Yep, thanks for that contribution. Um, and here, here are some of them listed uh, listed down here. This is the full list as of 11, and they had its covariance and all sorts of uh, really statistical functions in here, percentiles and so on, standard deviations. So you know you, you need to be a statistician on some of these to understand what they are. But you're right, there there were some very nice ones added in in 11. So thank you for that.